From Chicago's CAN TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs, and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. Welcome back. So um, the world continues to turn. Uh, the national and international news that we've been following has hit home because we're hearing now that some of the first particles of radiation from China, or from I'm sorry, from Japan, are hitting our shores. And uh, we have uh, concealed carry about to happen in Illinois. Recycling has been privatized. There are big, new, big stories on the police beat and everything else. But the Chicago City Council, ever vigilant, has passed or is talking about passing some legislation about horse pee. So there's a, that's the big news <laughs> today. And around our table to discuss whether or not horses should be cleaned up <laughs> after on Michigan <laughs> Avenue are John Dempsey from WRS. I'm anti-horse yeah. urine. And I so just want to go you on think record. It should be cleaned up. Well, I think it, in in theory, it's a nice idea to clean up the urine from the mm -hmm. street, especially with all the potholes we yeah, have yeah, because yeah. you don't want them <laughs> potholes, con yeah. congregating. But um, it's kind of impractical to have the guy with the with the big <laughs> See, there you go already with the big derby the hat jump stuff. down from the carriage and you know. And yeah. Paul Mikey <laughs> from ABC Seven joining us today for the first time. Glad to have you here, Paul. Horses so uh, should be fed foie gras. <laughs> <laughs> That'll take care of the problem, and then it won't be odiferous. Yes. Right. And from Chicago Media Workshop, uh, Community Media Workshop, joining us again, Tom Clark. Tom. I really think North Michigan Avenue needs more organic material. <laughs> That's right. It's it's not, it's a kind of an inorganic yeah, place, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're seeing uh, today also in the good old Chicago Sun Times that um, recycling is being privatized in Chicago, according to Franz Spielman's story today. Um, it looks like. Uh, the blue cart system uh, they have they have a union spokesman saying that he knows for sure that daily has signed a contract so we're going to see who got the contract let's see here let's look it up and see what we got waste management no <laughs> waste management got pinstripe the contract. patronage again <laughs> yes well the, the waste management got the blue bay contract yes and, and when a certain brother of the mayor was on the subsidiary board mm. of directors just a coincidence. Current chief of staff yeah, somewhere out east. Total coincidence. Because um, there sure. was privatized recycling at that time. Yes, it there was, was done by nonprofits and yes, they were was. kicked out and waste mm -hmm. management was brought in and we know how well the blue bag program worked. <laughs> I seem to remember a radio documentary <laughs> done by yeah, yeah, yeah. a certain morning <laughs> let's host. Not, let's not go there. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that uh, all these blue these blue carts, we've all seen that picture of the blue carts, thousands of them all stacked up in warehouses. Uh, I suppose the good news is this means that if they privatize it, everybody's going to finally get a blue cart, um, whatever that means. Hopefully that's, it, that will happen. But it, I find it interesting. This is the second story this week where Franz Spielman's source has been Lou Phillips of the Laborers Union. Mm. The first one a few days ago was the rat story. The rat story. That, there's, that nothing, plays big. there's nothing like scaring Chicagoans <laughs> other than putting a huge rat on the front page of the, of the Sun-Times. Which wasn't even really a Chicago rat, I don't think. No, was I, think that, that I think was a he was stock he was a member. Rat. He was a member of SAG. <laughs> he's, so he will, a, he's a union he rat. He was a union rat, so he will get residual. <laughs> but uh, here, you know, we've got a new <clears throat> mayor coming in, and he's, you know, talked about making changes. And so the union is unhappy about these changes. They're mm -hmm. unhappy that they appear to be taking people away from rat baiting and forestry services. And now they're unhappy that... Uh, Recycling is mm -hmm. going to be uh, loss of jobs. Yeah. Loss yeah. of jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Lou Phillips, uh, his direct quote in the Sun Times today is, "It's a kick in the ass to the people of Chicago and to my members. These are the guys who stood up and took comp time and furlough days, and now they're giving our work away." So mm. there and you have it. This is a day after the uh, Inspector General's report that 18 million dollars <laughs> a year is being wasted by truckers, city truckers who say they'll drive a guy to a job so he can do some painting and then they'll drive him to that job and then they'll sit and wait for him to finish the painting maybe even sleep in the cab of the truck those are MTDs I believe motor yes. truck drivers. yes yes so mm -hmm. uh, but but it is interesting times are changing mm -hmm. you know we, we've seen what's happened in Wisconsin and in Ohio with public mm -hmm. employee unions and and uh, Emanuel of course was not the guy that got the endorsements from the from the city worker unions Gary Chico got those but 
I think change is coming. Yes, and so if laborers are lost, why not members of the city council? Yeah, <laughs> cut the city council in half. Now that, that's an interesting one right there because uh, I think we all know that uh, the mayor, uh, the mayor elect, kind of floated this, and I, I'm not exactly sure what forum it was, but he let it be known that he thinks maybe this is something we really ought to look at, and I'm just wondering if um, he doesn't know that there's not a chance in, in all of. Uh, you know, in all of frozen hell for, for this to happen at the city council, but it's nice to be on the side of appearing to be wanting I, reform. I think is he's that, is trying that to show to some reform wardrobe. Mm -hmm. um, and it is interesting he's doing this while the governor, who of course shrunk the General Assembly, could be a facilitator of uh, legislation. Because you have to get a state law passed mm -hmm. for the city council to mm -hmm. shrink. So there are all sorts of hurdles to him actually doing this. And I see it more as behind the scenes leverage. Yeah, you know, he I'll says this is not my idea, but yeah. the council is not immune from change. We are all about change, mm -hmm. so let's discuss it. It came in in the suggestion box, so yeah, he yeah, floats yeah, it. Yeah. And then he meets with aldermen and they come in individually and sit with uh, the incoming mayor. And he says, what do you think mm -hmm. about reducing the size of the city council? <laughs> oh, I don't know, but am I on your team? Right. Well, I mean, w with the, with the uh, reduction in population, we're not talking about something like 59,000 constituents per, per alderman. But uh, I, I just happened to be up at the uh, 46th Ward candidate debate the other night, and, and that got thrown out up there. And, and both of these uh, candidates, Kappelman and Phelan, who really dislike each other, um, were the one thing I think they could completely agree on was that this would be a terrible idea to cut the size of the city council because uh, the argument is made that uh, if you um, well let's let's look at this something in in something in specific in their ward one of the big issues of course is development up in uptown north north side and what they're saying is we would then have if if there were fewer aldermen there would be more forces from outside our community deciding how these things were to be done. We have to defend our own communities in the city council and so does everybody else, so it makes sense to have a, a larger city council and more I, aldermen. I, I'm not sure I follow the logic of that, particularly since um, uh, the two candidates in the 46th Ward, um, uh, uh, Molly in particular, are newer residents mm -hmm. uh, trying to determine the future development of that community when their main opposition to the incumbent alderman was, you know, trying to uh, overturn 30 years worth of mixed development, mm -hmm. balanced development. Mm -hmm. And it's always concerned me in those edge communities where gentrification pressures might be taking place, why it is the newcomers have a greater voice or as much influence as the folks who've stuck it out for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I understand the logic of if there were fewer aldermen, more outside forces would have more influence or control over what happened here. It, 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 it seems to me that the bigger issue is, despite the relative savings in having fewer ward offices and staff and all that, is the extent to which the alleged strong council, weak mayor system would or would not come into play right. mm -hmm. because it doesn't look like we're going to get it, yeah, even though yeah, some of us thought yeah. with the daily regime ending that might begin to happen again. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, frankly, I didn't even think we would be talking about it today because I just thought the whole thing was kind of a joke. I mean, I, the, the idea that Chicago would reform itself that way is just so outlandish that it's not even worth our time to talk about it. But, you know, maybe maybe there is something to it. I mean, would would Chicago be better off with 25 aldermen? It, instead? Are you more efficient, more effective at lesser cost? And Dick Simpson has said, financially, there's not a great saving, so you can't argue that component. Right. Yeah, there's not there's not a great savings and as Tom said about when Quinn led the referendum drive to reduce the size of the legislature, at the time people thought, oh, fewer politicians in Springfield will save a lot of money. But I think back then um, you had like, there were like say two Democrats in a Democratic district and then there would always be one minority Republican or mm -hmm. two Republicans and a minority <laughs> Democrat. And an argument I think could be made that that system was more responsive to citizens, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you could make the same argument now, that do we need 50 aldermen? No, but there is more local control, local mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. You know who to call when, when something's going on, and so 
and and it really would not save that much money. Well, that uh, that, that is the one thing that that I think shoots the argument down is this notion that you're going to save a lot of money. I mean, it, it seems to me that if you if you took what, however many dollars they have for the st for the hiring of their brother-in-law to run the <laughs> office and the little bit of money that they pay their sister to rent the space from, if you combined it into uh, to two into one, then you would still need as many people to do all of the day-to-day -day operations. To plow I would the think. streets yeah, and to yeah. do the pick up the garbage. And, and for all the joking that we do, I, I've, my personal experience has been that a lot of aldermen in Chicago work really hard. I mean, they really are 24-hour people. Generally speaking, if they don't provide good ward services, they don't survive. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and I think a smaller group would make it easier for a mere mayor in a weak mayor system to actually control more oh, yeah. mm -hmm. because it would be a smaller group sure. right, right. And, and as we've learned from the shrinkage of the General Assembly uh, there were fewer independent voices whether mm -hmm. you look at that as a a party voice or even independent Democrats that were able to slip in under the old system mm -hmm. before uh, the now Governor Ken Quinn shrunk the I, number. I think you're right that most aldermen know they know what citizens want pick up mm -hmm. my trash keep give me these city services and if you look throughout history, I think some of the most corrupt aldermen that we've ever had who've gone off to prison were still pretty darn good at providing <laughs> the lights on. those city <laughs> services. Yeah, <laughs> because they knew because they knew they right. knew how you had. To and in, in the recent <laughs> blizzard, when we had when we had problems getting getting some of the side streets plowed, I think a lot of the aldermen used their campaign funds mm -hmm. to hire you know yeah, private yeah. trucks to go in there. I, so if we took the vote today and you three were the people, I, I think we'd get three no votes. I never thought I'd say this, but I think I would vote no. Wow. Because I used to think, oh, it's bloated, it's too yeah, big, yeah, blah, blah, yeah. blah. But the city's problems go so far so, beyond, so far beyond the, yeah, yeah. the, the it, $10 million a year it's you'd the, save. It's the same thing that happens where you have this, uh, I don't know, I, I remember many years ago reading one of these books about you know, your, uh, the military is going to build a $65 billion missile base. And then somebody points out that the uh, shed that they're using to store things in costs $700, and you knew you could get one at Home Depot for $150. And right. how can this happen? Right. That, that's kind of that's kind right. of what's going on here. Right. It, it seems to me. Can I? I might vote yes. You'd vote yes. Just to minimize the speechifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would depend who the 25 aldermen were. That's true. We'd, survived. We would have to pass right. judgment right. on their ability, right. uh, their oratorical skills. And, and since he's a friend of the show, we'd have to point out that Alderman Buss would still stay in, so it would be a 26 There have to be a place for Alderman Buss. You can't get rid of Buss. Alderman no. Ed Buss, right. No. So, um, <laughs> Along the along these lines, uh, this this little mini story that popped up the other day about um, I can't remember his name, uh, Bobby Richardson, the uh, head of streets, streets and uh, sand. the snow, snow command, command guy. Snow, snow command. Um, I mean, we're we're seeing he's being brought up on charges that he had some people go fetch his cigars and put gas in his car and stuff like that, and for that reason he should be fired. Um, I, I would rather say that someone like that should be fired because they didn't do a good job. Or so, I, that seems again, it, it seems like a kind of a parallel situation. Like we're looking at something that seems incredibly minor to me. Now maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Well, that, I think that raises the, the question about the whole inspector general because I think this is what Alderman said. I remember back. I think Alexander Versturis was the first ever inspector general, and I think he was criticized for not really doing anything. But the alderman. They didn't want the inspector general to investigate them, and they said, if you if you create an inspector general, he'll just be going after these nitpicking kinds of things. Now, the eighteen million dollar thing I mentioned, you know, that's that's a significant thing. If we have a system where guys are being paid to just right, right. go and sleep in a right. cab of a truck to drive somebody to a job, but you're right, you know, th it's penny wise, pound foolish mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And uh, this is something we've debated around this table for a while, but it, it, I'm on the side that says that I think the city did a pretty darn good job cleaning up that uh, blizzard. Oh, I think uh, they did. I, I mean, I've been around a long time. I mean, and Lake I, I don't Drive. One. Putting Lake aside the Lakeshore Drive yeah. thing, yeah. it was yeah. a remarkable couple of day cleanup. Right, right. We're in suburban areas with presumptively higher property tax proceeds mm -hmm. and better ability to hire private crews to clean. Took much longer. Yeah. But it's still yeah. defined in the written press as the fiasco mm -hmm. on Lakeshore Drive. Well, it was right. for the people who were stuck in right. it, but 
you know, I'm not so sure that they did do a bad job. Mm -hmm. There were people out there going car to car. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the uh, time-honored traditions of Chicago politics is that uh, there's always a fall guy for this, yeah. and they, they're usually not fired the day after. Usually what happens is that there'll be an item in Sneed saying uh, right. commissioner so-and-so right. uh, may have some marital problems or right. something like that, right. and the next thing you know, that commissioner is gone. Right. gone. Right. And when I saw this about, uh, I, I don't know anything about Bobby Richardson until yesterday, I didn't even know his name. Right. But when, when I saw that... He used to play that, for the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. Second, yeah. Good second baseman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw that, that was the first thing I thought was, oh, somebody's being measured for the jacket for mm -hmm. uh, Lakeshore Drive, and maybe it's him. I don't know. But I do think... Um, after the Lakeshore Drive fiasco, and, and Lakeshore Drive was a, was a fiasco. Was. I think if Daly was on the ballot, he would have been fuming. Mm -hmm. He would have had smoke yeah, coming yeah. out of his nostrils. He wouldn't have hidden for a couple of days yeah. like he did. I also think he would have been at the press briefing. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, he, just, he just wouldn't have been able to have stayed away. He would have been red-faced and yelling and screaming. So... Um, there's just so much to talk about today. I don't even know where to go from here, but we, we've kind of touched a little bit on the elections. Uh, we have an election coming up uh, next, next, well, there's the, the early elections are finishing up now. We have 14 wards that are um, having runoffs, and it seems to me that the big news is that there's not going to be a hell of a lot of news. Uh, the, um, uh, the incumbents look like they're all going to win. Uh, all of the power structures are falling behind all of the incumbents, the unions, the mayor-elect. Uh, so, I think Bernie Stone could lose in the 50th Ward because mm -hmm. that's uh, he's, he's in his 80s and a lot of people are un unhappy. And I, there was this controversy this week where he funded a secret organization that was paying for anti uh, Silverstein literature. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think there's a chance he could be vulnerable. And, and it's very, very hot up there. The irony is that happened four years ago when he had the closest uh, election mm -hmm. in a long time. And in fact, a couple of his uh, precinct workers went to jail right. because mm -hmm. there was voter right. fraud. Right. Um, this was a little more discovered, a little bit more ahead of the election. Um, uh, Deborah Silverstein is not seen as a perfect candidate. Um, uh, by you know progressive forces in that war that have been looking for Bernie to retire for some time and in the interest of full disclosure a strong advocate of public access television mm -hmm. uh, personally mm -hmm. interviewed him in this studio mm -hmm. about that issue but um, I think a lot of people believe it is time for him to retire and, and but for but him it's many of be those same people are thinking wow we've wanted to push this guy out for a long time but does that mean we're gonna vote for Silverstein and so it, it's it's somewhat that and it's also will his uh, remaining political operation have enough strength left mm -hmm. to let him squeak by once mm -hmm. more one more time and huh? and I, I actually given the numbers on the the uh, the primary day uh, um, I, I think he's very threatened. What did he get? What percentage did he get? He know? got uh, like 37 percent, and yeah. she got 34. 34. So, so you add up. Incumbent, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. that is very poor showing. <coughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we have some very tight races in 43 and four. Well, we mentioned 46. Helen Schiller's old ward. That that one seems to be just literally head to head. Nobody knows where that's going to go. Like most uptown elections, that will be. I bet within a few hundred votes. Yeah, I'm sure it will. And uh, uh, Tim Egan and Michelle Smith in the 43rd Ward in Lincoln Park, I believe that one's pretty tight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and Greg Hines with Cranes was reporting this week that Egan has been all over the map in terms mm -hmm. of telling union people what they want to hear and then telling business people what they want to hear, and that Emanuel, who uh, is supporting Egan, uh, called him in for a meeting because mm. he was concerned about the, mm. the flip-flopping, but that after this meeting, Emanuel is still supporting Egan. So without spending too much time on, on this because I really want to move on to other things, let me throw out a, a hypothesis here that uh, next Wednesday when we wake up we will not be talking very much about a revolution in the City Council. The City Council will look pretty much like it looks now. Which well is, is it might look guess? slightly different but I'm not sure Politically, the, the political look. forces will be changed that much and I think part of that is the way the the mayor-elect has handled uh, enmeshing himself in, in a lot of those local races. Um, mm -hmm. He's clearly lining people up, and that sounds a lot like what we've had the last couple of generations. Well, you, you've you spent your career, Tom, uh, um, working the community angle and, and uh, independence and community people. Uh, they just they appear to have been pretty much shut out in this in this race. It yeah, is, I don't know if that's a fair statement. It, it is seems that way very, very hard 
to run for office today, if uh, whatever political level you're talking about, without money. Mm -hmm. And most uh, community folks um, that aspire for elected office or independents have trouble raising money. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I give the mayor elect credit. He he bought the office fair and square with twelve million dollars. <laughs> um, he had two presidents behind him. He did um, that. Yes, he and, did. And um, I think that kind of set the course for how the runoff, how the city council elections themselves, and the subsequent runoffs mm -hmm. were probably going to go. But if you're looking for a, an example of a grassroots, you know, David and Goliath thing, look no further than the 47th ward mm -hmm. and what happened in yeah. in, in yeah. that ward. An where, amazing story where the guy yeah. just came out of nowhere mm -hmm. with very little money mm -hmm. and and took on the shelter organization and, right. and won. So it so. can happen. But it's it's kind of the same thing Tom was talking about before, though. Those were the newbies in the ward that did that. The, the, and, the people and, who had and, just arrived. And it is a wonderful story. And, you know, I would hope it would be replicated. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a convergence of, of factors there. I mean, the Fighting 47th clearly had dissipated mm -hmm. as a political mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. And this guy did his work door to door to door to door yeah. with no money. Yeah. And, and just clearly caught the imagination of some some veteran residents but clearly the newcomers well it's it's interesting how um, I believe uh, well Ben Jarofsky did a, a very interesting piece on some of the races and and did a very extensive piece on the 25th between Quahadamak uh, I, ho I hope I, I can never pronounce I apologize Quahadamak Morphin and Danny Solis yes um, which is an interesting kind of a reflection the other way where yes, you have the community organizer who has a lot of uh, credentials as a, as a community-based person in the Latino community which is diminishing in the 25th Ward and a, a longtime alderman who yeah, was 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 not so much in favor in the Latino community anymore. But then he flip flops on a couple of big issues, and the unions come by, and the money comes by, and the community guy gets shut out. And Jarovsky's view is that one of the reasons that it got that he got lined up against was because he wouldn't necessarily be a reliable vote in the council the way perhaps Danny Solis would. Again. These are these are opinions. This is not necessarily fact, but mm -hmm. you know th this is this is the kind of uh, well. Anyway, one of the parts of the irony of this is that it's the new people in the in the new people in the ward who are now lining up with Danny Solis. Yes. So the people the people who've been kind of um, forced out of the ward don't have that anyway. It, it's so complicated. But the big picture dynamic really doesn't change that much with the new mayor who already has announced he's going to hit the ground running with a new police superintendent, had a board of education, mm -hmm. all those things. So how uh, the new folks who are going to take their seats are looking at this thing and say, how, how does it change? Right. How do I change right. it? And I don't well, know that they can. left for me to do? What, what do yeah. I do? Yeah, yeah. Well, all mm -hmm. of us lived through the 80s, and we were here during council wars, and that was, that was <laughs> a great story for journalists to cover, but I really think it was kind of a fluke in history. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we will ever again have a rebellious city council you know battling with the mayor because mm -hmm. it just kind of settles into the chicago way of doing things where the mayor says i need your vote what do you need from me mm -hmm. and they work out all these mm -hmm. deals behind closed doors yeah. and it, we, yeah. we end up with pretty much a rubber stamp to the point where i think mm -hmm. it's in our water system somehow yes because well, one we, of the intriguing we'll stories this week <laughs> was the contributions by foundations to the transition effort yeah. for the mayor elect. Very interesting. Which, topic. Um, mm -hmm. as someone who runs a nonprofit, of course, I'm gritting my teeth because that's money mm -hmm. that didn't end didn't up in go, grants yeah. to keep our program services going. Right, right. And I'm not talking about just my organization, but others, because it's been a tough couple of years for nonprofits, yes. as, it has. as it has been for most small businesses as mm -hmm. we try to emerge from this great recession that I'm afraid is going to be another three to five years. But for a guy who raised $12 million and then has raised so much more since mm -hmm. to put into automatic things, why can't he pay for his own transition team? Yeah. Why does he have to tap? And I think it's because there was a phone call or two made, and we have paid for play pretty endemically throughout our system. And I, I say it kiddingly, but I wonder if it isn't in the water filtration system. But can I just say one thing? And we were talking about the 47th <laughs> Ward and the newcomers. Don't discount the, the amazing number of people who didn't grow up here and who have moved to Chicago mm -hmm who don't know, you know, the Chicago right, way. Right. That's a very good the point. The kind of That's people exactly who elected right. Scott yes. Wagner right. back right. and who elected that guy in the 47th Ward, whose name escapes me right now. But um, 
those are the kind of people, young professionals. They don't respect these, their ward committeemen. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. And uh, you've got all these internet startup companies in Chicago. Right. And I think that is kind of the wave. I don't know if it's the wave of the future, but it's a very, very interesting voting block that we have to pay attention to. There's no to. recollection and of the deep divisions in those golden moments when Ernie Stone stood up and looked over <laughs> Louis Gutierrez and said, you little, little pip squeak. squeak. <laughs> yes, we did all live through the ABC. Yeah. We can <laughs> all quote it. So um, we just got, we got to move on here quickly to a couple of quick things. I, Goose Island got sold for 30-something million dollars, and, and my first thought was, Wow, this is like a big company with infrastructure and people and trucks and God knows what else. And they got $35 million and Groupon was offered $6 billion? What, what uh, is that? Can anybody explain that to me, please? It's about my pay it's grade. It's about my pay grade. <laughs> the, the only thing I can say is that maybe with the Groupon thing, there's an infinite number of eyeballs that they could attract mm -hmm. to, uh -huh. to that kind of a thing where there's a finite number of people who like fine craft beers. But beyond that, I'm with Paul. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, right. think for a moment, because none of us are in this bracket, of um, you know how initial stock offerings and stuff like that work. You have a product. You could say the beer brewery is old line manufacturing, mm -hmm. and there's the stuff that comes out that you sell. Right. And then there's Groupon, which is right. off in the cloud. It's in the cloud. And it's, it's like newspaper publishing thing, and it's trying to get internet. into yeah. the latest, newest, hottest thing. And, and nobody and wants to miss the next right, right, latest, right, newest, right. Even though thing. one could uh, part Paul, of it. Excuse me, I'm sorry. We're, we're down to our last minute, Paul. We can't stop the show without having you talk a little bit about concealed carry. Illinois might go with concealed carry. I don't know if they have the votes yet, but the sponsor, Downstate Democrats, has we've never been closer and Harry Osterman who is gun control advocate and carries all the bills out of Chicago says we've never been closer on this issue so it is entirely possible it'll be called most probably in the house the sponsor says he's got 60 some high 60s votes he thinks he's going to ultimately need 71 um, Quinn has said he will entertain any bill give it thorough review but it's remarkable because the Supreme Court decision last year has changed the legal landscape and mm -hmm. the political landscape has changed considerably mm -hmm. too. There are people in office now who are more open to the notion of concealed carry. Mm -hmm. so well, while 48 it may not, states have Well, it. And, and Wisconsin will shortly have yeah. it when they get their house in order so because we'll be they now the have Republican government. Standing. We would stand alone. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to call time on this. It's, uh, it's only been 30 minutes. I can't believe it, but there you are. Tom Clark has been with us today. Tom, thanks so much for Thank being here. I know you'll be back again. I hope you will anyway from Community Media Workshop. Uh, uh, just a great voice in Chicago media. Uh, John Dempsey here from WLS AM 89. Thank you, Tom. And thanks again, old friend of mine. And also for the first time on the show today, I'm really happy to have you here today. Paul Meinke from ABC7. Thank you for being with us today, Paul. Thanks, I Ken. hope you'll come back again sometime, too. Thank you. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom here on uh, Can TV. It's a community service of Can TV. And, of course, you'll find us here on cable. You 630 Thursday nights. And uh, you can also see us on cantv.blip.tv. Or you can check us out on iTunes, video podcast, audio podcast. You can go to the Jewel, and we'll be standing there like at the checkout. Anything. We're, all, we're everywhere. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Chicago Newsroom.